ladies and gentlemen, there are two things that the justice system cares about. First is arriving at the moral, fair, or just outcome. And the second is about making sure that society is safe, operates smoothly, and where people don't have to fear crime in their communities. What we're going to show for you an open government is why both of these things are fundamentally harmed or destroyed at the point where criminal sentencing takes into account retribution. What do we do instead on our side of the house? There's probably a four-part criteria that judges use when sentencing instead of using retribution. First, they take into account the likelihood that you will commit this crime again or other crimes in the future. Second, they take into account the amount of time necessary to rehabilitate you such that you're able to integrate back into society. Thirdly, they take into account the amount of time needed to deter other individuals from also committing that crime. And lastly, they take into account whether you are a violent or non-violent offender and the protection that needs to be afforded to other individuals within society. So someone who has killed people is most likely going to get a much larger sentence than a mere non-violent drug offender because they pose a much greater risk to society. Rather than using purely moral attribution, we think this is the criteria they should use. Yep? Do you envision white-collar criminals being imprisoned on your side of the house? Uh, there's probably a justification to prevent people from defrauding other individuals and depriving them of future life savings. You can do that without retributive punishment. Two arguments, therefore, in my speech. First, why is this the only just and moral system that we can impose? Second, to how you get better societal outcomes and better rehabilitation for these criminals at the point at which you follow our policy. First, why is this the only just outcome? Firstly, we have to recognize that one of the only ways that we can legitimately punish someone's behavior is if it is a free choice, if they could have chosen otherwise. We think that it is dubious whether these individuals have true, full agency in this circumstance. Why is it that these need to be more or less free choices in order to be morally condemned? Because otherwise, it wasn't really them who did it, right? Anyone would have done it in their position, or it was merely uh, circumstances acting through them that motivated that conduct. Recognize the criminal law already recognizes this all the time. It's why we have the defense of duress. It's why we have the defense of insanity. The problem is none of those go far enough because I'm going to show you why almost all crimes that are ever committed are heavily duress and heavily not true agency. Why is that the case? Firstly, recognize that every circumstance an individual has ever had in their life has duressed them to commit crime to some degree. Firstly, poverty often motivates the majority of crimes that individuals commit, which means virtually any kind of economic theft is not a true free choice because they've been duressed by the circumstances to do it. Your emotions in any given situation also will motivate how you behave in ways that you don't really have control over, given that we have primate brains that respond in certain ways in certain circumstances that we don't have the full agency to control. How you grew up, the family you had, the experiences you had when you were younger heavily inform how you behave today, the behavior that you believe is acceptable. That is equally something you have no control over because you have no control where you were born or how your parents treated you growing up. And moreover, there's been some evidence that the genes that you have on a genetic level affect your, uh, your predisposition to commit criminality, also something that you have no control over. So on this ground, it is incredibly questionable whether individuals are actually free in the full sense to decide what their actions are, and that we actually would argue that they're often just informed by things that are completely outside of their control, and thus not able to morally condemn them. Second, we have to consider that on a possible extreme level, free will doesn't even exist at all. If you look at a deterministic view of the universe, where basically everything is just cause and effect, I have no control over what I'm going to say next, what I'm going to do next. All this has been predetermined by every single other existing circumstance. Given that this is plausible, there's a reasonable conception of this world in which no one has any free choice, and thus none of their actions is something that we can assign a moral value to or not, because it's not them who did it, it's merely the inevitable fate of the universe. Given that this is most likely a world in which we live, you cannot have retributive punishment because they don't have an actual free choice. Moreover, you have to recognize that this is the only just outcome, independent of whether you believe that individuals have full agency. Why is that? Because there is no objective moral values. Recognize that morality is a pure human construction, is incredibly arbitrary and subjective, fluctuates most of the whim of the culture and the time. But recognize that retributive punishment fundamentally hinges on the ability to say this is an immoral action such that we are able to condemn it. But the point at which morality doesn't really exist in an objective sense, why the heck can we say that you have some kind of objective level of moral condemnation that we can assign to an individual? 
Contrast this to what we have in our side of the house, which is facts, the likelihood that you will harm somebody else and harm the functioning of society. These are things that we can determine to a degree of objectivity rather than relying on a moral criteria of punishment that is purely arbitrary. Next, I want to look at the basis of the criminal justice system, because the criminal justice system is not based, one second, on morality. It is based on <coughs> pragmatic outcomes. And you just look at this, the type of things we criminalize, and the types of things we don't. So we don't criminalize adultery, even though we consider it to be something that is morally wrong, but we do criminalize things like jaywalking, even though we don't really consider that to be something that's morally wrong. This is because the underpinning of the justice system is not about moral retribution, but it is about pragmatics and societal function. Yep. What about crimes committed by people with high levels of individual autonomy who systematically abuse the power they have over other people? Is molesting teenage gymnasts objectively immoral and worthy of punishment? Look, whether it's objectively immoral or not is irrelevant, given I just gave you a bunch of reasons why that person's choices were probably heavily constrained based on their biology, based on their past experience, or whether free choice even exists at all, that's not engaging with our material. Next, I want to talk about rehabilitation. Two points under this. Firstly, recognize that retributive sentences tend to be much longer than the sentences you're going to get on our side of the house, because you use these criteria and then tack on another decade for retributive factors. Why is this bad? Because longer sentences have been shown to have a correlation with increased rates of criminality when you leave prison. And there are reasons why this is intuitive to believe. Firstly, it's harder for you to reintegrate inside the longer period you've been removed. It's harder for you to get a job and thus escape poverty. This is often a motivating factor for criminality. So when you use a retributive system of justice, you're more likely to get more crime in the future, more harms to other individuals. If they want to believe that those actions are immoral, they actually lead to more of them occurring. Secondly, we want a broad change in the culture of criminal justice. Right now, prisons are too focused on punishment. They give prisoners horrible conditions because it is just a morally wrong action they committed and they want to punish them for it. What we think that we do on our side house is we shift the focus away from this over time. Telling society is a major message that it is not about retribution, that it is purely about pragmatic outcomes, motivating a change within the criminal justice system itself, which leads to better outcomes. This is the only just policy. This is the only policy that benefits the safety of the state. How does the post? I thank the speaker for those remarks, and now I invite the leader of the opposition to continue the debate. position 
Constitution, which is that of victims. I think it is incredibly important to note at this point of the debate that they didn't even acknowledge the third part of what the just justice system serves to do, which is not serving a greater good, but serving one or an individual or a group of individuals who was harmed. That is what we think that retribution is specifically and uniquely there for in the justice system, as it is the only part of the justice system that is not concerned with helping that individual to, who committed a crime rehabilitate or keeping them off the streets. It's the part of the justice system that speaks to someone who was wronged and says that you suffered and we are balancing that with an equal amount of suffering. It speaks to the victim and it goes, it gives something directly back to them and that is something that was not acknowledged by this proposition team. We think that is an incredibly important factor to consider when you're talking about the role of the justice system and when we think it was wrong for them to ignore. Before I go on, opening. Yeah, we can punish individuals on the grounds that we prevent future victims from being created without any degree of moral condemnation. Moreover, why should I care about how a victim feels if it caused broader harm and more crime being committed and more victims? Of thank, thank you. I'm going to respond to the idea that it creates more further crime in the future, but it's just not okay to say that we're not going to care about a victim at the moment and prioritize future victims. Because surely if you want to prioritize future victims exclusively, it's because you feel sorry for an individual who was wronged. Why are you going to ignore the individual who was wronged right in front of you? You can't just have a justice system that is constantly thinking about the individuals in the future, because that means no one actually falls into the bracket of who was helped at any given time. So, onto this idea of the function of retribution. So, there's three sub-points to this. The first thing, the idea of victims, and I want to be incredibly clear, why we stand specifically behind retribution as being a necessary factor of the justice system is, is that it's the most individual give back to the person who was harmed to support them and show them that they are getting some sort of um, whatever it is the sort of thing that people get from the idea that someone is locked up and inflicting suffering on them. It is because it helps individuals overcome a wrong that was done to them because they understand that someone who was able to inflict that harm on them will not be accepted by society, but moreover that the society that protects them has the ability to inflict that harm on another individual, helps them reckon with the fact that there are broader structures that are able to protect them when they have been violated in this way. So we think that it is incredibly important and something that both proposition teams will have to engage with about why they think it is okay to override the individual right to justice of any one individual rather than because every other thing that they've talked about, notice in the context of this debate, is for helping the person who committed the crime or for helping broader society. They haven't explained to us why this is fair for that one or individual who were harmed. No, thank you. Thirdly, and secondly, sorry, and this is also a response to their point about how this is going to create further harm in the future. I think it's not true that the length of your sentence and rehabilitation are as mutually exclusive that they would like to think that they would like to portray. Because, for example, Say I'm put into a situation where I have 10 years ahead of me in prison and I am constantly being broken down and told to engage with the sort of services that are available for me, whether that be rehabilitation, whether that be engaging in some sort of learning program. It is much easier for me to just ride that out and not do the thing which is accept that I've done something wrong and that I need to change when I know I'll be getting out sooner, when I know that I can just keep that up for two years, rather than having to force myself to keep it up for 10 years, I'm much less likely to engage with those processes in the first place. Where does that leave us in terms of impacts? It means that all the sort of negatives that opposition, proposition are talking to you about, about how you're exposed to gang culture, how you're exposed to thinking that society is against you, is also true no matter of how long you spend in prison, but the effectiveness of the sort of tools of rehab are, are less effective when you don't have this retribution element. Because it is just almost impossible for you to say exactly when someone will re be rehabilitated in X amount of time. So we think that it, this current system is actually what enables rehabilitation to work as effectively as it can. Sorry, Before I go on, close. Is it OO's serious contention that without the structural weight of retribution, the criminal justice system will underpunish the average individual who comes into its crosshairs? Probably. We see people who have committed rape getting out after six months because of the fact that the way in which the, the, the justice system is structured already doesn't take the victim into account as sufficiently as it need be in some parts of the world. And we think that that is an undervaluing that we don't stand for and something that we wouldn't like to be enshrined within the operation of the justice system. Thirdly, I want to talk about trust in the justice system. Because a principal justification for a specific conception of morality is what proposition think will win this debate. That is not true. Because we have a justice system built on the most 
perfect conception of morality, but people think that it is not doing justice. That if they are harmed, the person who harmed them will not suffer an equal amount as they do. That is not a justice system that will be bought into. It might be perfect, but it will be completely ineffective because no one is going to offer information to allow that justice system to work. I can't explain to you why we think that when you're wronged and you suffer, that the individual who hurt you should suffer too, but it's a conception that exists around the world and it's something that people look for in their justice system. We think that this is an incredibly big harm in this debate because that's where you have people starting to lock themselves out of engaging with that justice system because they don't think it's right to bring forward crimes and report crimes because they don't think that there's anything in it for them. The way the proposition have pointed this, they have, have painted this, is that almost I should feel that I should bring a crime forward just so I can fix the problem with the person who committed a crime against me. That there's nothing in it for me and we think that is wrong and something they need to contend with prior to oppose. I thank the speaker for those remarks. Now call upon the Deputy <coughs> Prime Minister to continue the debate. Shocking titles for that one point rebuttal on victims. The first thing we told you on victims is that we think that future victims are the more important class to consider just because there are more of them. We think that if we can prove to you that when we constantly imprison people and put people in cycles of poverty, they cause more harm on net, it's unclear why we should care about that initial victim more than the future victims that we could occur. The second thing we get, we tell you, is that you can be a victim and be someone committing a crime in the first place. You can be compelled by certain situations, not just by a lack of moral agency, but also because you might be forced to steal because you're poor. You might commit crimes because of certain preconditions that you can't help. Yes, we can reduce your sentence, but if we say retribution is important, and because you have done a moral harm, we have to punish you in some way for that, that means that we are always going to be giving you a longer sentence, regardless of mitigating factors for that. The third thing is, I want to really consider what the utility of punishment for victims is. As in, maybe you see justice for your offender going away, or the person who's harmed you going away, but they're going away regardless, just for a different reason. They're still going to be locked up, presumably, to try and get some kind of rehabilitation treatment, or for protection if they are a risk of future situations. I'm unclear what the day-to-day -day justice or day-to-day -day feeling of a victim is to have someone locked away and being tortured. Do you think about it every second of the day? Do you think about those conditions? Does it really make your life that much better? The comparison is if you're the person oh, suffering no. in that position, you will feel it every single day. You will feel that punishment. You will feel the fact that you are in a horrible cell in dirty conditions, having crappy food, and that will then affect your future ability to reintegrate with society and to make your life better. So I think the utility of victims is not that great on their side of the house. The fourth thing we want to consider is that do victims even want this in the first place? We think that without consulting with them, you can't prove that. The last thing on this is that we're happy to prioritise the terrorists. We're happy to block you uh, away if we think that there is a very high risk we're going to be doing it in the future. Retribution is about punishment because you've done something immoral, and I would say we are punishing you for that immoral. It's about punishment, not about deterrence. So, firstly on retribution. The first thing we talked about this was talking about free will doesn't exist, exist. They say, oh, well, in some cases, you have chosen to do things. Look, we think that it's much better to focus on what you can control, right? We think that we can control uh, how much how we can rehabilitate you effectively. Or deterrence, we can make quite clear, right? If you're in a cell, you're not going to commit crimes in the future. Because it is so difficult to determine if someone meant to do that crime or not, it's so difficult to determine how much we really should punish them for it, how responsible they are for it. Comparatively, one we can determine with a lot more certainty. The second thing I want to talk about about is not all people who go to jail are guilty. The poor have terrible access to legal defence. These are structural problems that you can't fix because paying for state defenders is super, super expensive. Giving pro bono for poor people, really, really expensive. The rich don't want to do that. You will never give the poor people great legal access. In many cases, so my, my mum's friend was recently told to plead guilty to keying a car that he did not key because the legal fees would be so great for going to jail, right? We think that in many situations, poor people go to jail for reasons that they do not deserve to go to, and you stick them in there for longer and force them to undergo punishment they are not responsible for, when you have a system that takes retribution into account. And that is a system that is impossible to fix. The third thing is, it's almost impossible to get proportionality. A lot of the crimes that we do, a lot of the punishments that we give people now, are considered incredibly different to the ones that we gave earlier. Think about the death penalty.
penalty, for example, the use of electric chair, or the use of incredibly inhumane forms of punishment, because we can never determine how fair that punishment is, it becomes very difficult for us in future years to say that it was a moral action or an immoral action. Comparatively, if we don't cause massive harm to you, we are not put in that same position. The fourth thing is we were told in the info briefing, this is a global context, there are many societies around the world that punish people for being gay, and so that being gay means that you've committed a sin and caused a huge amount of harm to people. There are many situations where just being part of a group causes you a huge amount of harm, where having some of the basic level of agency causes you to be imprisoned and punished because you have violated the rules of your society. I am not happy to live in a world where we put those people in prison and punish them for it. The very worst case scenario is we say we will do things to stop them from doing that action again. We will do things to stop them from continuing that action. That could still be bad, but it's not going to be anywhere near as bad as the punishment and torture you put them through under the name of retribution. So, on to rehabilitation. Why isn't rehabilitation far harder. I'll take one of my two POIs now if anyone has one. Yeah. So by your own metric, when you're talking about people like the criminalization of homosexuality, you get no change on your side of the house at the point in which there's a large degree of certainty that they will reoffend by continuing to be homosexual. Engage with the fact that you're still giving them the same amount of sentences that off would also have to own. I mean, whilst I don't think that you can convert someone's sexuality, I think you can do things to deter them from doing that same action again. So the difference is we wouldn't say we're going to force you to undergo some level of torture for being gay and because you've committed a gay act, we will try and do things to prevent you from doing that in the future. Like, I, again, if I had to weigh it up, I would say that like, internal punishment or being trapped in prison is far worse than being told that you cannot have sex with men. Again, just as a gay person, that would be my perspective. So, why is this representation far harder? Firstly, you get people far willing less to be open about their problems. So you're less likely to seek help for a drug problem if you're worried it could be used against you and put in jail for it. If you're an accessory to the crime, you don't go forward with information, even if you were being forced because you're wary of that imprisonment. We can become comparative on our side of the house, you get better access to rehabilitation. You're open about your problem because you're not fearful of being punished. You come forward with information because you're not fearful of being punished. You think the worst case scenario should be put away for some level of deterrence, but in a lot of cases you won't be. Yeah. Even if it's totally arbitrary that I committed a crime because I have no free will, it's also totally arbitrary that a crime was committed against me. Why should the justice system make absolutely no allowances for just giving something back to individual victims? I mean, we say that you are probably going to get something back indirectly, in that your offender will be put away if they're going to commit a crime again. But just that, so you will indirectly benefit from that, but the CGS just is not taking CGS, is not taking that into account. It's an indirect benefit you get from it. Secondly, how you create a terrible relationship between state and the communities that you punish. So, if you look at the fact that even though uh, white people and African Americans commit petty drug crimes, the same amount, you put African Americans far longer into prison. Why? Because retribution is subjective, because we have different punishments all over the world, different punishments within states, different punishments for different groups, because we can never effectively determine that. That means that in many cases, you create not only unfair punishments, but terrible conditions between communities and the people who are punished by them. Firstly, you create a fear of police that you don't use an access because you think they are out to get you. Secondly, you create cycles of Im imprisonment and poverty in terrible conditions. You meet people in jail who are also offenders, you learn worse conditions from. You're put under awful conditions that you feel resentful about society when you go and integrate. You haven't been taught skills or given books or educational resources because we prioritise retribution over it. Thirdly, it's the gigantic misuse of funds. You could spend this money on providing schools or welfare vouchers or a bunch of other things for communities that might stop crimes committed in the first place. When you are always concerned about retribution and giving justice to victims, you don't do that. Also, so many victims are really rich. I'm a poor person and I steal from a really big company. Why does that rich person deserve to get retribution from me? Look, I don't think that you need to have long sentences. I think you, we, we can still have long sentences left by the house if they want that, because that counts towards deterrence or rehabilitation. We don't need to arbitrarily punish you for the actions that you've done. Very proud to propose. Thank you, Speaker, for those remarks. Now call upon the Deputy Leader of the Opposition to continue the
OG try to tell you that retributive factors taken into account are arbitrary. They are not. They are decided on things like whether your crime was premeditated. They are decided on things like whether you were a repeat offender. They are decided on things as to whether your crime was out of necessity or whether it was done because you had a personal business with the, with the person who you committed the crime against, right? That is not arbitrary. In fact, it's about as arbitrary as turning black people into a, into a statistic that decides whether their first crime means they are likely to reoffend, right? Everything that exists in the justice system in terms of the decisions they make is arguably arbitrary and arguably important. We're going to explain not about the moral stuff they try to confuse you about, but rather what the societal impacts are of making these decisions and how they matter. But importantly, they try to talk to you about structural problems. It is important to account that a justice system that feels they have a role in retribution has a role in retribution in both aspects. That means adding to sentences, making people sentences more miserable, but also in doing things like suspending sentences and, and doing things like giving people parole, right? Like recognizing that crimes happen out of necessity or recognizing that people right. might, like, might, might have been influ influenced in a way that means they don't deserve the same level of punishment that somebody committed the, that's committed the same crime but premeditated that crime, right? That is also a factor in punishment, that is also a factor of consideration. What they stand over is a world where everybody who commits the exact same crime gets the exact same sentence. Uh. We tell you that's not a justice system that is fair, it's not a justice system that will be readily accepted by the public, but it's also not a justice system that fairly punishes criminals. Closing go. Sorry, so if I have committed the same crime multiple times before, I am presumably more likely to commit it again, and therefore, on the grounds of deterrence and incapacitation, will get a higher sentence. What is unique about any of the things you've listed? Okay, to the uh, word crime out of necessity, potentially. That's something that you could argue would mean you're more likely to repeat repeatedly offend, but also is something that happened because of, of a factor that influenced you or a factor that, that changed your decision. That could be an example. Equally, something that's premeditated doesn't mean you're likely to repeat it again because it could be a person you have a personal uh, problem with. No, let's talk about structural problems because OG are very keen to discuss with you, for example, things like cost and things like racism and how they play into, uh, play into the, the dynamic and how they solve that problem. First argument, okay, you can change issues like racism and classism in the justice system by, by monitoring other things. For example, how often judges are likely to convict people versus other people. I would like to point out that the biggest problem with things like racism and classism exists in the justice system in terms of things like sentencing rates and not in terms of whether or not the punishment is longer or shorter. They don't change that on their side of the house. In fact, they make absolutely no dent in that whatsoever. And furthermore, though, these usually don't happen for minor crimes. Like, situations that, re that, that retribution has the biggest impact is situations where a crime lasts for a longer amount of time. So it's not keying someone's car, it's whether you murder someone. Those things generally have, for example, a higher burden of evidence, they generally take more time and more investment, like things like uh, uh, things like uh, public prosecutioners and equally people like who provide legal aid are more likely to be invested in making those go right because they're higher profile. Th that means that we have less of those consequences. But also it's so unclear to me why like reoffending rates and, like, uh, uh, and deterrent rates don't happen more on their side when they think that it's more important to deter black people or where it's more likely that if you're a, a Latina who has, has a history with gang violence that you're more likely to reoffend. All of that still happens on their side insofar as it's the public mindset that means those people are sentenced for longer and not the other way around. But when they talk to you Honest. about free choices, there are two responses to this. First of all, other people are resisting those choices all the time despite suffering the same environments and they don't get anything out of this. They are in fact more likely to be at risk if somebody is released from jail at an earlier stage if they are indeed more likely to, 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 to commit a crime or indeed even just feel more dangerous in their, in, their, in their locality if that person is released earlier. But second of all, it's so unclear why, for example, taking into account like crimes out of necessity doesn't deal with this being a problem altogether. We think that is part of how you like, recognise your punitive role well, as the justice you system, are. we think that happens less on their side of the house. Yeah, opening up. So, unless you are, are happy to uh, let someone out who has committed a crime of necessity, even if it means they are more likely to commit a crime, crime again, all your arguments are about protection and about deterrence, things that we Okay, so this. all of these factors are balanced when you decide on a prison sentence. You don't just decide, we're going to punish this guy, make this guy's decision based on deterrence, and make this guy's decision based on whether they are likely to reoffend. right? You balance all of these things. What we are saying is we would prefer to exist in a world where, where, where the factors that led to somebody making a crime decided how long they had to be punished for that crime.
crime and equally how they are recognised in a court of law in terms of understanding the victims or the, the, the criminal circumstances as well as the victim circumstances, how that means better outcomes for everyone. Let's talk about that. Let's talk about criminals, right? Because they tell you that on our side of the house sentences are much longer. We explain to you why that's not true because you can reduce sentences equally as you can extend them for retribution, so it's not necessarily true. But furthermore, Ashley explains to you why in a world where this doesn't happen, in a world where somebody who premeditates murder or in a world where somebody who, who who's a repeat offender gets the same sentence as somebody who's a first time offender or gets the same sentence as someone who accidentally murdered someone or whatever it is or, or murdered them because they needed to or need, needed money or whatever, in a world where that happens, society is less likely to accept that those parties are equally guilty. Regardless of whether they are or not, and regardless of how the justice system treats them, the fact that they get a punishment that is equal is unlikely to be accepted by the majority of people, especially because it probably gives, brings them the, 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 uh, the sentence down so that everyone gets the mean sentence as opposed to some people getting more time and some people getting less time. Ashley explains to you this leads to people being more likely to reject people, especially people who commit more heinous crimes but don't but spend the same amount of time in jail as somebody whose crime could be described as the same but less heinous, I guess, and, uh, and how the society is likely to treat them. So when OG tell you that this is it's worse because when you spend more time in jail, you're more likely to like not get you're jobs right. and you're more likely to be socialised in that area. Uh, what Ashley explains to you is that when you come out of jail, people are going to feel they have an obligation to punish you. So employers are literally not going to employ you because they don't think you deserve a chance at life. People are going to reject you and chun you in your community because they think you got out of jail too early. But furthermore, people are just going to feel unsafe. Let's talk about that really quickly in this point on perception of the justice system. Because this is about how people perceive fairness. And they perceive the, all of the things that happen in a crime, whether it be the motive of the person who committed the crime or whatever else, as being punishable because it adds to people's guilt. That's how we perceive guilt at the moment. That's how we perceive how serious a crime is or isn't. That means as people, we believe that people deserve to be treated differently. We believe they deserve different sentences on the basis of how much harm they intended to inflict or why they intended to inflict that harm. That means that if you have a world where the justice system doesn't recognise that, people don't think the justice system has their back. But that has a worse implication in terms of crimes that are particularly heinous. For example, child molestation. For example, people who are part of gangs. For example, uh, uh, cases of sexual assault. Because those things are harder to convict, but also the motives of people who convict them are often particularly heinous. And the reasons why victims feel they have an, a, an ability to convict those things is because they think the criminal system will recognise how heinous those things are, how much they intended to cause harm, and will feel like they will be represented and recognised. That doesn't happen on government. Please oppose. I thank the speaker for those remarks. Now call upon the member of government to continue the debate. about their communities, about their families, about the kids whose lives are destroyed, but talk about trying to punish a parent who they have no control over and they cannot talk to them Before that, um, two extraneous points of rebuttal. So they've um, firstly told us that like, um, you know, going to rehab, um, like, rehab is more effective than non-prison sentences, not true for two reasons. So firstly, you're likely to have suffered far more in prison, which means you're likely to have been more bitter, feel like the punishment is not for you or is not deserved, so you're like, more likely to be angry not to subscribe to it. But secondly, because you're more likely to have been acclimatised to general violence and general corruption in prisons. Second bit, um, the reverse of this, they're like, you know, you're not gonna, it's not gonna make any difference in, as to whether or not you join a gang. You've got more incentives to prioritise your life after jail, and like, your comfort after jail, if that's immediate, right? If I'm gonna spend 10 years in prison, I've got more incentive to stay clean of drugs, because I know, um, less incentive to stay clean of drugs, I know I'm trying to make the next 10 years of my life comfortable as opposed to the next six months. Therefore, you do have more incentive not to get involved in the worst exits of prison, the shorter your sentence it is. Okay, substantive. Why this is worse for victims? So OG told us that like victims probably don't think about what they do. We think that's sometimes true, but we think a lot of the time it's not, right? And we think it's very difficult to, to predict what you want in the future for two reasons. So first, like, the criminal justice system as a framework has horrible consequences, not only on the victim has been discussed, but on their kids who lose a parent, who lose income, who often are more likely to be criminals themselves, and are more likely to suffer disproportionately despite the fact that they are three and did nothing, right? The second thing is after crime and during a crime, you're likely to be incredibly emotional. You're likely to be confronted with someone who's done harm upon you. You're likely to be talking about it, thinking about it on stock, you're still suffering from the trauma which that crime inflicted on you initially. Well, this does not mean that you're not acting rational necessarily. What it means is that your emotions at that point are likely to be exceptionally different to emotions at most points during your life. What this means is that your emotions are likely to change when you get distance from the trial. 
What this means is that there was a chance, and there was like a relatively high chance, that you regret pushing for the highest punishment. Now, there's been a debate up and down this bench to whether victims are going to push for higher or lower punishment. Look, I can tend to you that when you are traumatized, when you are hurting, you're most angry, and you're most likely to feel like a wrong has been done, and you're most likely to want someone to suffer because of that wrong, right? I won't basically concede this when they're like, it's victims' rights to push for retribution, to give something back. Victims often feel, in the moment, they deserve something back, right? So what this means is that you're potentially opting into a harm that you could not predict, but which, but which means that you feel the responsibility for the suffering of a three-year-old for the next 10 or 20 years. Prison sentences are really, really long, so you've got plenty of time to change your mind and feel that guilt. And you're never allowed to forget it, right? Because often the memories of your crime are very, very present because it, they're what triggers and they remind you in your day to day. So you're like, likely to be stuck with trauma for a long time. But secondly, your community is likely to reject you, right? Because even if your views don't change, your community does. If there are people who, like, uh, recognize that often crimes are committed against people who are proximate, so crimes like to remain in communities. This is particularly true of poor people. What this means is that, um, like, you know, if your community sees like people suffering and they perceive it to be your fault, and even if it's not right, this has all victims irrespective of whether or not they push for retribution, because recognize that child abuse generally isn't public in this in this sort of thing. The community sees you as responsible for the suffering of others. They see you as like potentially vast amount of community suffering, responsible for the suffering of the, of the kids, as I was saying. So then, when I get to reject you, be hostile, particularly as, the, as particularly as time goes on, and particularly as the harm to you seems to have ended, but the harm to the children, the harm to the people whose parents were in prison and seem to go in the future. But third, and thirdly, and finally, like, you might not really understand the impact, right? Like, often people who have crimes committed against them aren't familiar with, like, the worst excess of the justice system, aren't familiar with the way that their sentence is going to be impacted in terms of general courts, right? So you might not intend for the punishment to be inflicted on your victims. Not only is this true at the time, it's just, um, in the future, this is true during the time of your prior, right? You might feel amazed uh, meant to duress if you are aware of these consequences to act in a way that you don't feel comfortable with. If you're aware that you're going to hurt your next door neighbor's kids, you might feel meant to duress not to push for something even if you want to, which causes you massive emotional harm. We recognise this isn't going to be true for every victim all of the time, but we think the massive harms are enough, and we think that it's going to be true enough for the time that you should um, outright it, you should ban it outright. This is particularly true um, because of the um, effect it has on communities, as I'm going to go on to talk about. So we have like, so we think that um, uh, um, the protection. So we think this second point that we think this undermines rehabilitation and the protection of society. So OPG did a like, great job of analysing why we think you know criminals are more likely to be offended under that right. We also think broad consensus that this is the most important point. Even if you do believe this is true, that rehabilitation is important because it grants rights to victims, if there's only a portion of the times, but if the harms of going to jail are certain, if the harms of creating future criminals and future victims are certain, the harms they create, you should always prioritise that. Now, why are you far more likely to create future victims and future criminals? Because as I've, um, I've, as I've told you throughout this speech, um, we think that like, you make far more people more likely to commit crimes. Why is it more likely that kids commit crimes and their parents go to jail? First, because they lose an income, right? This means that they're, li they're living, on, they're living like, more likely to live in poverty, more likely to be forced to commit the crimes for necessity of evil being so bad. <coughs> Second, because you lose parental oversight and you lose parental love, not only from the parent that was initially arrested, but from, I think you were just the second man, but from the parent that um, now has to work double time and wants to try, try and make ends meet. You're also more likely to feel embittered and feel angry, you're likely to face societal rejection because of the stigma associated with having a parent that is a criminal. All this means that you're more, less, more likely to be rejected from traditional institutions that would provide you support, you're less likely to provide for yourself, so you're more likely to be forced into crime and necessity. Now, those are what we can't agree as to what sentence you do as a parent, we can agree that that initial criminal record is devastating. It stops you being able to get a job, it puts you in prison and inflicts the initial things. If we can stop people getting sentenced initially, that is the most important thing, we should especially not inflict this arbitrarily on kids who did not choose who their parents were. We think that you should file cases afterwards. Go. Surely this is all relative, so the sort of stigma you put on someone at the moment for going to jail for five years will now just be condensed down when you uh, presumably they still have some sort of criminal record and you will attach that stigma to whatever line it is now in the CV because you pr still probably think it's a heinous crime. But like a lot of my, um, a lot of the harms I was giving you are directly proportional. Right? If you lose an income for one year, that is very different to losing an income for five years or for ten years. Like those harms are proportional. Similarly, like if you lose your parent for a year, you lose a parent for five years, that's far different. Like in terms of like, love, you get the terms of attention, you get the amount of childhood development. Crucially, unlike crimes in prison, like the, um, like the monetary and, and like emotional impact you bear are probably pretty proportional to the length of time that your parents are in prison, right? So we think that like you can probably justify harming three-year-olds if it like if it like you're protecting the harm of future three-year-olds. But uh, insofar as like you like guarantee like a uh, far more risk in the future, we don't think this is justified particularly hurt society. Sort of go. Okay, so OG proposed that we do this based on rich, uh, re, re, likely to, likeness to reoffend. Surely it's better we quantify punishment based on something that actually happened as opposed to a statistic. We think that, like this is like we think that you are like we think that like if something is actually like yes we think we're still doing it by something that's actually happening. I don't understand the point of that POI particularly. But I'm going to get on to stuff about um, unpredictability. So I recognise that like <coughs> OO for some reason wanted to tell you that rehabilitation is a stuff from basic like stuff like reoffence. 
No, the thing is, it says on his impact statements, like people write what it did to them and they make a decision based on that, right? This is incredibly unpredictable. A, because judges weight them differently. B, because like white people are just more likely to write them, right? And they're like, we can monitor for racism in different ways. Recognize, if tools of justice system are being used in a way that is not perceived illegal, even if it is disproportionately harmful and naughty, it still can be allowed, right? So if you can say it's not that people are being racist necessarily, it's just because white people are more likely to write it, it doesn't necessarily mean that people are going to change the way it happens. Because it's just like a structural thing as opposed to just a target to think, right? We think that this therefore means like um, minority communities are far more likely to be impacted, which means you already have to the most vulnerable people in the most vulnerable communities that did not opt into it. Well, we think that if you make the justice system up, which you need to do as far as different victims are going to want different things, different victims are going to push for different sorts of things. We think that people are like less likely to engage with it because they don't see it's fair. And we think people, um, it means that people think the justice system adequately recognizes them and recognizes the harm that's inflicted. So what we wanted to tell you it was incredibly random. Because we do not believe that random people deserve to suffer arbitrarily with very foul to propose. I thank the speaker for those remarks. Now call upon the member of the opposition to continue the debate. under discussed is whether or not there is a moral imperative for retribution. And what we're going to give you, partly in extension, is why courts have an actual moral obligation to consider moral culpability when they are actually sentencing people. Because understand that moral culpability is intimately linked to your agency and autonomy over the decisions and criminal activity that you engage in, which is a function of your privilege and power. Retribution is the only way to punish these people who do commit crimes as a function of privilege and power and give any form of recourse to their victims who are often the most marginalized and racialized people within their own societies. Before I get into two extensions explaining that, I would like to refute closing government. We hear two big ideas coming out of them. The rest will be interwoven as it specifically relates to analysis about moral imperatives. But the first big idea is that victims will regret demanding vengeance in the heat of the moment after the crime in terms of the things they demand for. I have two responses. One, understand that victims do have agency to make informed decisions about the amount of retribution that they're actually calling for during the criminal justice process. Understand that when courts are taking into the account of things like impact statements, it's informed by psychological counseling and services offered to the victims so they can actually access that sort of informed decision making about what they actually want in the long term. Also understand that when you're hearing from victims, it's usually at the end of a protracted and lengthy trial where they've actually had time to immediately cool down. I think to assert and then say, after this period of time, after like just given the ba basic resources, which I think is reasonable to speak, which is basic access to psychological set counseling, that victims can't make informed decisions about what they want in terms of who's actually being impacted by the sentencing is just absurd, and I don't think it's relevant to the, I think, this sort of autonomy that I think that we should believe that victims have in terms of them being the best actor to have access to the context that actually demands what they want in the long term, because only they want know what they want in the long term, but also understand that retribution is not just decided by victims, and the analysis I'm going to give to you, I'm going to explain what the moral imperative is and what we actually want courts to think about when they're making these sorts of considerations. The second thing we get coming out of uh, CG, though, is listen, the kids are going to suffer. Two responses. One, people are independent moral agents, and the state has an independent interest in your own criminal activity as it's not related to your citizens, to children at the point at which it needs to engage in punishing you. But also understand that this is an argument against sentencing and incarceration of any time. I'm happy to say that the retribution aspect of the criminal justice process should be something like a higher fine that you're experiencing rather than just throwing you in the slammer. Like they're talking about a specific mechanism that hurts kids, which is incarceration. I'm happy to have retribution actualized through other methods that might not be as damaging to kids. It's not engaging with the principle of this debate. Let's talk about the principle of this debate. The justice system has a moral imperative to enact retribution on offenders with high moral culpability. Um, I think it's forced when it comes to your, your actual free will, when it comes to your choice as to whether engaged in criminal activity is a privilege for some and not for others. That's what's been missing in this debate so far. So understand that individuals who are coerced into joining gangs or steal food to survive don't have low, like high moral culpability because they have high choice in terms of the decisions that they actually were forced to make. But understand that there's an entire category, classification of criminal activity that does fall into high moral culpability and there is an enormous imperative 
live, both morally and also practically, as to why it should be the focus of severe punition and retribution, rather than just going through the other criteria that's been talking about. Understand that many people engage in criminal activity who actually exert control over their own external environments, and who have incredibly high amounts of individual autonomy and access to things like their own personal agency and decision making, right? I think that's a cause of a lot of sorts of crime we're talking about that need retribution. Like, and, 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 and involves abusing the power you have over people's, right? That's what child molestation is, where you abuse the trust and power you have over children. That's what political corruption is, right? These are crimes that are never going to be punished under OG's side of the house, but that you have to understand do involve high amounts of moral culpability, and that there is an actual social and moral imperative to punish them because of the egregious nature of their children. So actively shaping people who actively shape the choices of others, but who aren't just subject to things like poverty and socioeconomic forces that determine their own life trajectories, but are people who have power to set the trajectories of others and how they live are the ones who do deserve retribution, because these are often the ones who don't get any form of recourse, because they're probably not going to re-offend. They can con probably convince a judge that they're not going to re-offend, and that they'll have a really time rehabilitating back into their wealthy community and the wealthy family they come from. These are the people who use their power to abuse marginalized people in society, and they have absolutely no form of actual recourse. I'll take uh, opening government. Uh, even if you commit a crime because you're in a position of power, that is itself predetermined by your circumstances. And the fact that you, okay. compared to any other powerful panel. person, panel. are predisposed to commit a crime is equally arbitrary and not true agency. Panel, I'm going to take it as a fact in this debate that you have the choice about whether or not you want to molest the gymnast teenagers who are under your control. People always have the ability to make choices for themselves. That's informed by the access you have to power and your own privilege. Those are the things that inform your free will. The people who have the most free will are often the ones who abuse it the most severely, and when they come before the law, it's incredibly important to get that sort of buy-in. Yeah. So understand you need to do this in order to have real conversations about when moral culpability actually exists. I think it needs to be an active component of the discourse because it's the only way to punish the most privileged within societies at the point at which they're called in and when we agree that they're less likely to re-offend and they can rehabilitate relatively yeah. quickly based off of their economic wealth. I'll take closing. Okay, victims of gangs and economic crimes will still have impact statements and still be thrown away for longer. Can you explain why the numerically more significant yep. poor gang members and socioeconomic criminals are less important than the few people? Here's the thing. We don't have to defend victims get to decide everything. We say there is an objective concept of moral culpability that courts have a mandate to actually apply to people when assessing whether or not they had autonomy when they were engaged in criminal activities and whether or not it was a personal choice about an expression and assertion of their power over others rather than just uh, like being forced to do so by external factors they can't control, understand that like people in power or control the external factors that shape their lives. Understand this, and secondly, the point and extension. And I think there's a practical element to this debate. Because understand that retribution must be alive within the justice system because there is widespread societal demand for it. What do I mean? I think sanitizing any government institution of human emotion leads to wide, the widespread belief that these institutions are unresponsive to their needs. So people start stop buying into it and start actively undermining it. So this means that victims and their supporters lose faith in the criminal justice system as an avenue of real reason. Course. And this has enormous impacts in this debate, such as a massive shift towards a number of other terrible outcomes that haven't been discussed. One, increased support and tolerance of police brutality, because they see a need to preemptively enact the moral imperative on retribution where the courts cannot, right? That's when people start buying into things like police brutality. And that's when people start like, supporting political measures that are aimed at preemptively punishing criminals because they don't believe that the criminal justice system is an actual way of actualizing their own human need to see their emotions expressed in terms of the sentencing of other people, right? That's when people stop buying into public institutions and start actively undermining it and looking to other ways via extrajudicial action, but most importantly, support for, I think, truly despisable alternatives that are always going to be focused on disenfranchising and punishing minorities who don't deserve it and allowing people in power to escape. Very proud to oppose. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker, for those remarks. Now call upon the uh, government whip to conclude the government portion of the two. up and down or bent as to what the word retribution means, so I want to be incredibly clear. 
We can punish people to incapacitate them because their presence in society is damaging. That solves for OO's challenge about whether you were premeditated. Because you premeditated and thought about killing someone in cold blood, you are probably the kind of person who is more likely, writ large, to kill someone else if you are capable of making that logical calculation, and therefore it's important to lock you up for that reason. We can deter other people from committing crimes. That solves for the molestation and sexual assault problems, because shockingly, off bench, people in society do not want children to be molested and will probably be willing to support greater sentences to discourage future people considering molesting from doing that, irrespective of whether you use the word culpability or not. But finally, we can rehabilitate people. So OO says, well, sometimes it takes longer than expected to determine whether someone needs rehabilitation. Shocking news, we can extend their sentence until they have been rehabilitated under the frameworks of government bench. Look, there is a constrained economic optimization problem that the legal system solves on our side of the house between these three principles. They have to justify a sentence that goes outside of that optimization makes those individual and societal interests worse off for the duties and obligations dubiously of victims. They therefore had to justify that this was a right that victims were owed and that was good for those individuals, which they didn't. Three things in this speech. Firstly, the little bits of CO that weren't direct repetitions of OO. Secondly, victims, which their entire case rests on. Thirdly, the rest of society writ large. Right. Firstly, closing stuff on culpabilities. Firstly, the subset of cases to which this debate applies on their side are incredibly small because rehabilitation is connected to agency. If you really intended to do something and had the power to do it, presumably you were of, of less sound mind and less good moral character will take longer to reform and we can punish you on the grounds of rehabilitation anyway. Jean Valjean won't re-offend for stealing in the loaf of bread because presumably it was transient economic circumstances, given the welfare state it occurs on either side of the house, that caused them to make their crime. So you don't need to lock them up for ages or to deter other people who are starving from doing things that they need in order to survive. Whereas Enron, and like US gymnast coaches, very clearly cause material harms to large numbers of people that we want not to happen in future, so we can punish them on the grounds of deterrence. So I just don't think their harms have any consequence in the real world. But secondly, even if some privileged people are punished a tiny bit less, we don't care. Because sometimes, if you can't find a pension who's been sufficiently harmed by Enron's fraud to say, I was materially harmed. When you don't have an impact statement in court for majorities, as Bobby tells you and isn't responded to, then people think, oh, well, the social impact of their crime must have been less, and don't punish them as much as they should. Something that only happens on their side of the house, because there's an expectation that there'll always be a victim in the docket standing up saying, this is the harm that was caused. So on their side of the house, they think there's actually a risk that Brock Turner type incidents do happen at the point where the victim is unwilling to stand up or whose testimony isn't trusted by a jury of 12 white men. But thirdly, even if that's not the case, we don't care because we were told you and didn't get responses to the structural ways in which minorities are like to be overpunished because white people will always stand in the dock and talk emotionally to a group of other white people about how these sorts of crimes were uniquely devastating to their household and you should lock that African American up for another five years, meaning I don't care if very rich people are made up of slightly worse off at the point where large numbers of very minority people, or very unprivileged people, sorry, are made worse off on your side. Let's talk about victims. This clearly wins around because the entire op's predicated on the notion that victims deserve or benefit, no, from a right to control. OO say we need to help present victims, we need to show victims that they mean something, and we need to build trust by empowering victims. That poses the relevant question. Do we empower or make better the lives of victims? Or therefore, that Bobby is the only speaker in the debate to explain to you how victims are made actively worse and therefore will engage with the justice system less and not value the state that's being given to them and therefore we shouldn't give them something that will actively make them worse off. Firstly, because they're likely to overpunish beyond what they'd have wanted at the point where they're surrounded by trauma and the media is baying for blood. They say, well, things have calmed down like 12 weeks after a trial. Not all impact statements happen during high-profile murders. The vast majority of them were routine break-ins that get settled literally 48 hours after the crime is committed. So that emotional trauma they talk to you about does often exist. But secondly, even if they don't overpunish, they face heightened anguish about the fact that a man's life hangs in the balance and they have to weigh the future of their community and society and what people outside are telling to do with their own personal moral duties to or not punish that individual. That's just a principled um, amount of duty to place on an individual already in a traumatic position that we told you ought not be imposed on people facing that level of suffering and no amount of counselling can deal with it, CEO. I'll take opening. So you have based your harms for the most vulnerable on sentence length, but you rely on statistics about likelihood <coughs> to reoffend to be what will determine who should be punished for long term. Given that these statistics tend to be incredibly racist and classist, how can you not also de so, still so deprive one, those minorities children of their parents? Firstly, because in a POI response, you conceded that you'd be punishing more, so it's your own argument that's justifying this when I POI'd you in LO. But secondly, because impact statements are more racist because people are more likely to believe white people talking passionately, and because white people are more likely to show up no 
know their rights as victims and make those arguments in the first place, meaning that those kinds of mechanisms are more likely to be skewed towards racial majorities than statistical ones. Thirdly, whatever happens, you open yourself as a victim to public condemnation when it was your choice and not the choice of some statistical machine or the organs of the state that decided whether or not to punish someone. OO say if victims can't make impact statements, they'll, be, they'll take it out with individuals in public. That only happens when the media and society has conveyed the norm that it is the duty of individuals to enact punishments on other individuals in crime in the eye for an eye way that retribution encourages. When that norm goes away because we say individual people's involvement in the justice system is not the relevant one, it becomes substantially less likely that kind of reprisal and the racist policing that CO talks about is likely to happen. Close it. Here's the problem. White juries will also be less willing to believe that minorities can be rehabilitated in the first place, so you also can extend the sentences on either side. We get white people in power actually put in jail because I of their moral culpability. I told you that the, white, the impacts on white people are incredibly tiny, and it is much harder to make the mathematical justification that throwing away someone with a gram of marijuana is good for society than it is to have someone standing up and say, drug crime hurt my neighbor in an emotional and visceral way that makes it more likely people we throw away. That is the clear comparative we gave you to why sentences would be more discriminatory on their side than ours. Let's talk briefly about society writ large. Because if the purpose of the criminal justice system is to protect the innocent, we ought to be on the courtroom and recognize the innocent children who are harmed by people who are locked away for longer. Even though they're locked away for longer, they're fined more from these guys, which means that they face greater economic suffering on people who didn't consent to those harms. Even if they're not fined more, the moral condemnation of being told they did something societally wrong hurts their prospects in life and their ability to exist within communities in society, bad for some of the least consenting people within the world in general. But we offer an extra critical impact to society in general, which is the most important facet of the criminal justice system, is it be predictable and that inputs lead to outputs, because otherwise people don't trust the organs of the state and don't report at the point where they don't know they'll get fair justice delivered. We told you why this process is uniquely volatile, because some people don't give impact statements, are too afraid to, or their impact statements aren't heard because of the colour of their skin, which means sentences are more random on their side of the house, people trust the justice system less, and it is likely to bear the burden most greatly on people who are already most disprivileged. Vote CG. Uh, I thank the speaker for those remarks, and I call upon the opposition web to conclude the debate. You're here. of courts to consider the moral culpability of a person who has committed a crime. It is not simply a victim impact statement being the sole deciding factor in how much the moral culpability of a person's actions factors into their sentencing, right? The actual decision is an abstract weighing done by the court, much in the same way that the court weighs every other factor that goes into the matrix of determining what a sentence actually looks like, all the things that the op bench has talked about, right? Courts can do this just as dispassionately as they weigh all the other things, because that's what we expect courts and judges who set sentences to do. Even in the event where humans are flawed or racist or overly emotional, we still confer upon them that ability because we recognize that there is literally no alternative. Okay, two things in this case. First, I want to talk about morality, then I want to talk about both. First of all, on morality, OG tells you that you have no free will. Look, I'm just going to say maybe it's a matter of degree. Right? Like, we are all to a certain extent constrained by certain factors beyond our control, but then within that, I think that there are some people who have more agency and power than others, right? I, like, I, I think that's something we can probably con concede just looking at the nature of how society is organized. What that means then is that there are going to be some people who, because they have more agency and have more power, are going to be committing crimes exclusively because they abuse the power they have over other people. This is what Matt talks about when he talks about the ability to weigh moral culpability. They never actually provide you a link on their side of the house in any of their speeches as to why, like, the, like, the example that keeps coming up of like the person like selling drugs or involved in gang violence is going to be judged to have higher moral culpability than like a corrupt politician who has been doing things like stealing from his constituents or creating things like the situation in Flint, Michigan, which I think is an act of mass violence perpetrated by corrupt politicians, right? I think on our side of the house it is those kinds of yeah. people that actually have their actions be weighed more heavily when trying to determine the extent of their guilt. What does this mean? Their response to this, when Matt talks about this, is simply to just pick on one example 
example that Matt mentioned was like the child molestation thing and say, look, people have an interest in preventing this, so like they're obviously going to go away. The first thing that we have to recognize is that that isn't actually always the case, right? The nature of power is such that people do escape justice even for the most heinous actions. The thing is, they ignore the other thing that Matt tells you about, right? Yeah. Like, people like politicians engage in massive political corruption that has massive systemic harm for the people on um, whom like that they like are supposed to serve and protect, right? So somebody like like somebody like Rick Snyder or whoever it was that was like presiding over like the situation in Flint, Michigan, I think is guilty of a massive amount of violence against constituents, against millions of constituents to whom he was directly responsible. I do not think that those people that participated in that system that resulted in the deaths and illnesses of countless people are ever going to face any kind of punishment that is in any way equal to the moral culpability that they have. But I think we can at least get close at the point to which we tell the justice system, you must weigh this in your decision. Sure. Beyond just a, uh, in a minute, beyond just a dispassionate weighing of facts, beyond just a dispassionate weighing of whether or not you are likely to reoffend, it should include a dispassionate weighing of how responsible were you, how much power did you have, and what is the gross damage that you caused from your negligence. Open it. We prioritize rehabilitation, which creates skilled and repentant defendants who have admitted they've done something wrong. Who's more likely to reintegrate, thus have a better life, and less likely to make crime when they leave prison? An angry ex-con who thinks society screwed them over, or someone who is skilled, able to integrate back into the labor market? Yeah. Okay. And when you change societal culture more to that, okay. way, you. where you don't Thank want to contribute. Thank you. Corners. Okay, so I have two responses to that. The first is, I think we can actually have models of restorative justice on our side too, right? I think we can obviously say that you have core culpability for the actions you committed, and that we will actually use the same kind of restorative justice models that they talk about on our side. Of. We don't have to have all our prisons be gulags, right? We can actually integrate some of those methods into our practices. Recognize this is something that occurs in the status quo, right? There are like theorists of reintegration who put forward the idea of reintegrative shaming for people who've committed things like sexual violence, who say that it is incredibly important to say people to people who did this, what you did was heinous. You must own this for the rest of your life. That is a part of your reintegration into society that says you must wear this on your soul, recognizing the harm that you did, but that we will also do things like equip you with the tools necessary to do, to do things like get a job, to do things like actually reintegrate properly into society. That's something that happens in the status quo because the people who try and do things like, like enact restorative justice measures in the status quo aren't stupid and they recognize that they can actually thread that needle. That's what they do. No. Okay. But then CG. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. Sorry. Um, then uh, CG says, "Look, uh, minorities are always going to get overpunished because people will always believe white people." A couple of things. First of all, vict victims who are themselves poor or you know, are like members of minority groups, I think, deserve the recourse to be able to say that they were harmed, particularly as they don't have a lot of agency in the other ways in which to be able to access the justice system. Right? I think that is incredibly important. But the second thing is, again, I think at the point at which courts are asked to do things like, like weigh all the evidence in the status quo, this is just another form of evidence, right? This is just something that can be entered into. I don't see why that's something that we don't have to engage with. Uh, actually, I'll take a closer look. All the sentencing algorithms you cross weighted on our side of the house exist on your side of the house. All that is different is that you add in a fact of a tool that's often used by privileged people against minorities. Why can you justify in shining these people that you keep telling them have all so, the advantages? So I think this is the only way to actually punish those privileged people in the event that they actually go to court, right? Given all the like avenues of power they have to escape justice in the status quo, I think this is the only way we do things like send the people who like poison the people in Flint, Flint Michigan to jail for something approaching the amount of time that I think would be morally just. Okay, so let's talk a bit more about victims, right? OG says that they just prioritize future victims, and they never actually explain why those future victims are more valuable, right? I think the people who actually have a real harm done to them in the status quo are the only people we can consider as far as they literally the only people that exist in this equation, right? But then Matt also explains to you that the point at which you ignore victims and erase them from the justice system, you sanitize the justice system of human emotion, you shake the trust that these people have in the justice system. He goes beyond oh, oh by actually explaining to you the kinds of actions that they take in terms of how they would want to actually re shape our perception of justice in the status quo, right? At the point at which you have more entrenched support for things like police brutality or things like mandatory minimum sentencing or at or like different laws used to criminalize entire segments of the population, this is the only way in which people actually feel secure because they recognize that the court system is never going to be able to give them the satisfaction that they want. I think that's actually the point at which you create more victims to the kinds of like entrenched state violence that is going to be perpetrated against people who otherwise wouldn't have been victimized in the status quo. Which means that like given that both gov teams give you like this kind of like 
imaginary number that we can never establish of how many victims are going to exist on whichever side of the house, at the point at which we can prove to you that things like entrenched state violence, things like police, police brutality, get more like support on, our, on their side of the house, that's the point at which I think we can prove they're going to give you more victims in the long run. Right? The last thing that CG says, though, is like, look, uh, like you get, get things like, uh, like, like a lack of predictability, and that's really bad because victims often can't do things like predict things. I honestly don't think that the law is nearly as cut and dry as they say. I think it is weighed by humans all the time, and the point at which we ask them to weigh one more factor in the decision, that's going to be suggested. Very proud of you. Thank the speaker, for those remarks. I invite everyone to cross the floor, shake hands, and Yes, yeah, so we have to go to such a house. 120. Oh, no, no, same thing.